and welcome to Choose to Sleep, the fellow webinars. Um, I would like to thank um, Dr. Irfan, the ASM, and also Sally, who is helping me today to present this case um, about advanced pap therapy practical teams. Um, my name is Dr. Salim. I'm the director of the respiratory care unit here at Mayo Clinic. So again, welcome to this webinar series. So I have no conflict of interest. And a little bit of housekeeping. You probably are pretty familiar with this as you're following these fellow webinars, but questions can be entered in the chat um, and will be answered later at the end of the talk. And this webinar will be recorded or is being recorded as we speak right now and will be posted in the SM a couple of weeks later. So what I tried to attempt with this presentation um, in the next hour is to try to put together tips practical things that you need to know when you're handling advanced PAP therapies. And this is tips that I've seen, and I hope that you as fellows can find it useful and practical in your daily practice. And one of the first tips that I would like to share with you is that sometimes we get focused too much on the qualifications of these devices, and we forget the most important part is to be familiar with the diagnosis and the pathophysiology behind the diagnosis. This is why tip number one is before selecting a PAP mode, you know to know the pathophysiology behind your diagnosis. And why is that? Because in front of you, you have the positive airway pressure devices, the spectrum. On one hand, on your left, you will see the typical CPAP. You're very familiar with them. This is a uh, devices that they will be producing the splinting of the upper airway. They will increase a little bit the functional residual capacity with secondary gain of better VQ matching and a uh, little better oxygenation, but there is no breathing augmentation. There is no su uh, respiratory support. There is no ventilation. On the other hand, on the right, you have the non-invasive ventilation. By definition, all bilevels, all BiPAPs. And they have two main functions with these bilevels. Function number one, it will be augment respiratory support with augmentation of the ventilation. Therefore, all pathophysiology that is grouped into the hypercapnic respiratory failure um, will be supported by the NIV. The other thing, not only you can support the ventilation, but also you can augment it. You can augment it and maximize this to a level in which you can put your muscles at rest. And you have heard about the intervention of high intensity BiPAP that we do in COPD years in order to put that muscles at rest during the night so they have a better uh, um, muscle load capacity when the patient wakes up the following morning. So the other role of the non-invasive ventilation as a bi-level is not necessarily ventilate the patient, but to modulate the respiration pattern. And just the typical example is in the chain stock breathing with the use of ASV. So the uh, non-invasive ventilation by definition by levels with two main roles, either they're gonna support the ventilation, they're gonna augment the ventilation or they're gonna modulate the respiration. So. As you can see in this graphic, you have the ventilator support on one stream to another to see and to describe these devices. The following uh, table will describe the type of non-invasive ventilation you're familiar already. As a bi-levels, they could be as simple as a bi uh, BiPAP S, S for spontaneous without a backup rate, or those with a backup rate that we call ST, spontaneous and timed. Um, you have a second group of non-invasive ventilation that we call volume assured pressure supports or VAPs. And then you have the third group that is the adaptive servo ventilation, the ASV, the modulation of the respiratory pattern that we just mentioned. Here in this table is the uh, try to merge the idea of the mode and the indication, and you can replace that word indication by pathophysiology and the actions of these devices. So you, by understanding pathophysiology that you're about to uh, uh, treat, you can choose the mode that it can best fit that pathophysiology. So on the first part, we have the BiPAP S and ST. The EPAP element will be helping you to pneumatically splint the upper airway. The 
IPAP with the pressure support will help you for the ventilation if ventilation support is what you need. And the backup rate can be having the role of intervening during periods in which there is no respiratory effort, like central sleep apnea, or when the patient needs to maintain certain minute ventilation. Just to make a pause here, minute ventilation is the respiration rate multiple by your total volume. So when your respiration rate is not kicking in, in enough uh, levels in order to maintain a ventilation, then your backup rate can help into that. The second group, the volume assured pressure support. Now you remember that there are two main brands that they have different targets in the ventilatory support. These are devices that they are designed for ventilation. So if your pathophysiology is a hypercapnic respiratory failure in the background and you need to ventilate, these are devices that they have been designed for that. And we're gonna go in more details in a few minutes. And then the third group, the adaptive servo ventilation. These are the ones that their pathophysiology will be targeted, the central sleep app as the hypocapnic, normal capnic respiratory failure. And these are the ones that they will be producing a breathing pattern correction. So think about the, again, the chain stop breathing, hyperventilation, apnea, hyperventilation, in which the, um, the ASV will be supporting during the apneic event and backing off and produce the, or, or provide the less uh, possible uh, support when the patient is in the hyperventilatory state. So what it tries to do is to turn something that is um, an abnormal breathing pattern into a corrected breathing pattern or modulated breathing pattern. Tip number two, let's talk a little bit about uh, the PAP modes and the boxes. This is another thing that you need to know. Um, you know your pathophysiology and your diagnosis. Now you need to know how you're going to deliver, what type of box are you going to use in order to deliver the mode that you will be choosing. And when I mention about the boxes, I'm referring about the two big groups that we use. One is the rats and the other are the ventilators. And you know pretty well that um, the rats is the ones that you're more familiar with. This is the ones that you use in your in your sleep clinic every day. The rat is a construct, it's a word that has been created from billing purposes and refer to all these devices that they do not have batteries, they do not have alarms, they are not designed to um, uh, treat patients with life-threatening situations. These are um, uh, devices that we use most of the time with different type of modes. And this contains pressure modes like BiPAP S, ST, the BiPAP T pressure control, VAPS and ASV. So as you can see, as the technology advances, all these boxes contains most of the modes that you need, but they do not contain batteries and they do not contain alarms. And this is what they make them different from ventilators. On the left, you have the devices column in which you're familiar most of the time that you're handling your clinics. And on the right, the circuit system, the systems only allow to connect with one limb um, a tubing, and it, a, you have to use it with a vented mask, meaning that you have to have a leak in order to protect this uh, patient in case of disconnection, which the CO2 will not be building up in that mask. On the other hand, you have another group of boxes that we call ventilators. And as you can see, most of the pressures targeted that uh, modes that you have been looking into the rats can be also be uh, uh, seen there, the BiPAP S, the BiPAP ST, the pressure control, um, but also you have these devices can deliver also volume, not just pressure, but also volume. They can have even, uh, these devices can have these mouthpieces ventilation that you have seen your ALS patients. If you're a neurologist or a pulmonologist uh, background, you will see these patients with these wheelchairs, with this uh, type of uh, um, of a straw that uh, they may take a breath and help them to inflate and phonate better. You see the ventilator devices that you see there, the most common ones in the market nowadays, and I'm sure that the list can continue going on. But these devices, again, these are devices that we use and we need, I usually ask myself, why would I use a ventilator instead of a rat? And the question is, is your patient going to die if it gets disconnected from uh, the device? If the answer is yes, you need a ventilator. 
The second question, it is, how is the trajectory of the disease of this patient? If this is a rapid progressive ALS patient, it's very likely that at some point, very uh, short future, this patient will need a ventilator. So don't prescribe the rat, prescribe a ventilator in this patient. So these are questions, and sometimes you do have treatments. For example, I mentioned before, if when we tried overlap syndrome with COPD or COPD alone with high intensity treatment, we need to go to pressures that they're extremely high, that rats that you have seen before cannot reach that pressures. And we need to go to ventilators of their uh, flow that they can generate is much higher. Therefore, their pressure are much higher. So sometimes you need to understand what do you need in order to know which box is going to be delivering these modes? Because most of the modes are shared by these two groups of devices. In these devices that we call ventilators, we can use venting mask with a single lumen, um, as you can see here. But also we can use double lumen with no venting mask and we can connect it to the trick. And for that, we stop calling uh, a non-invasive and we call it invasive ventilation at that point. So tip number three, before selecting settings, know the building block of your BiPAP. And this is comes because, you know, now or in the future, all these um, companies will be throwing back to you a lot of fancy names that will mean different things and they will be brand and, uh, and, and, and copyright in different ways. But if you go to the building block of how these devices are being set and where are the settings that they need, you will understand that all of them, they return to the same uh, building block, the buy levels. And if you understand uh, with a strong um, concept what a buy level means and where are the components, you will understand any mode that is BiPAP based, which by the way, they are all the NIVs. You will understand it doesn't matter how much they wanted to spin the names commercially, what are the building blocks or the stru basic structures of it? You can deconstruct the mode. So all by levels, they will have an EPAP, all by levels will have an IPAP, and all by levels, the difference in between the IPAP and the EPAP is what we call the pressure support. So the pressure support or delta pressure, as sometimes we refer to, will in certain way will be equivalent to a tidal volume. I want to pause here to tell you why I bring this very basic concept that you probably know by heart for different reasons. You have been, um, you have seen this already. Um, the same brands, sometimes when you are jumping from one device to another, let's say that you're doing a sleep medicine in patient and you're doing a sleep medicine outpatient, and you have a device that they have used in the hospital, a device that they are using in the outpatient, you may see that even in the same um, uh, brands, the settings may refer to an IPAP or the settings may refer to pressure support. And not all DMEs will have respiratory therapies to help translate your prescription to the settings of the device that they have. And you may need to understand very well the, um, the difference in between IPAP and pressure support and how you can translate one to the other. Concept number two, regarding the pressure support or delta. So most of the time when they come and present a case to me um, about a, uh, a need of ventilation of a patient, they come to me with the, with the settings. And they come and they tell me, well, you know, uh, my patient is on an IPAP of X and an EPAP of, uh, of Y. And uh, the most important information is what tidal volume, what minute ventilation that translates. Why is that? Because you, healthy, I give you an IPAP of 10 with an EPAP of 5, and you may be generated 500 cc's of tidal volume. If you give it to me, if I'm sick, I have interstitial lung disease, the same 10 over 5, the tidal volume will be 250, 300 maybe. So every time that you wanted to ventilate someone, these settings needs to be understood, but also need to be understand that they are in the concept of the compliance of the respiratory system, meaning who is the patient that you have in front of you. Numbers are numbers, but not necessarily translate physiologically into a specific tidal volume. You need to see what is the, the, the result of your intervention. Tip number four, 
before changing advanced settings, know their impact on the patient's breathing. You're about to immerse with me into the advanced settings changes. And these are the things that you need to be cautious. You need to be, if you decided to change it, uh, to change this these uh, settings, you need to be very aware about what these changes will, how we're going to impact your patient. And you need to be very aware about that you need to follow these changes very closely. These are not changes that you do and you shall see the patient next year. This is the changes in which you have to be very closely follow them in order to see how much the, the patient interact well with the device. This is what we call synchrony. So let's return back again. Always I'm gonna bring you to the basics because that is where your decisions are gonna be. So you're gonna be having your EPAP machine. You will have a trigger. These patients with um, uh, by, in BiPAP or BiPAP ST, most of the time they will have a trigger sensitivity that the inspiratory flow below which the patient will go from EPAP to IPAP. This is what we call trigger and that can be changed. Then you have something that is called a rise time. A rise time is the pressurization time, the amount of time that it takes to jump from EPAP to IPAP. Then you have the timing that the patient will remain in IPAP, and this is what we call inspiratory time. And then, sooner or later, the patient will have to finish the inhalation and enter into exhalation. Therefore, the machine needs to time that perfectly in order to cycle out of the IPAP into the EPAP. And that is going to be giving us that area under the curve that we call tidal volume. So this is another concept that you need to understand. Now, before, when I present you the, the first building block, the bi-level component, you understood that the difference in between the IPAP and the EPAP, what we call a pressure support, translate into a tidal volume. So you have only one dimension that you were thinking. Uh, as much as I increase my IPAP, I increase my tidal volume, and you're correct. But remember, you, you are in non-invasive ventilation. Eventually, your mask will not tolerate that and will increase a lot of leaking. And second, the patient will not tolerate it either. So you need to go to another dimension to increase your tidal volume if you need to. And this is the dimension of time. So inspiratory time, now you can manage that in order to increase your tidal volume. So let's go step by step in these components, because again, this is a, a, a concept that you need to understand if you decided to intervene in these settings. So let's go a little bit about the rise time. And in the rise time you have uh, let's say that this is the normal rise time, and you decided to do it, the pressurization in a much shorter period of time. This is, for example, look at me what I'm going to do. So I'm breathing, and all of a sudden, when I start my breath, if I shorter the inspiratory time, this is going to look like that. If I do it slowly, it will look like that. So the pressurization time is the amount of time that it will take to change from EPAP to the IPAP. And in patients who have overlap syndrome, meaning COPD obstructive sleep apnea, because of their COPD component, sometimes we try to put their, that rise time into a shorter period of time. Sometimes we have obesity hypoventilation syndrome. It takes these patients longer time to ventilate and expand. Therefore, we wanted to, that, to do this rise time and increase that. So by default, it's 300 milliseconds. This is the red line. And you can do it at short at 100 milliseconds if you wanted to do it adjusted for an overlap syndrome. Or you can do it up to 600 milliseconds if you're in an obesity hypoventilation syndrome. You need to manage that. And we will talk a little bit about that, how you can pinpoint your patient when they have problems with their rise time. So hold that thoughts there. The other uh, component is the inspiratory time. Let's say that red is your normal. Let's say that you have someone who has obesity hypoventilation syndrome. What is the main pathophysiology? They retain CO2. So what do you want? You want to ventilate them. The larger the tidal volume, the more you're going to wash out the CO2. Therefore, if you increase the inspiratory time and not just rely on the delta pressure, this patient will ventilate better. The opposite will happen with overlap syndrome. You have COPD plus obstructive sleep apnea. What happened with COPD? They tend to hyperinflate. 
then you don't want to spend too much time in inhalation. You want to spend most of the time in exhalation. Therefore, um, you want to make that um, in, um, inspiratory time shorter so they can spend more time in exhalation. So one of the most difficult concepts to try to, to share um, uh, with my fellows is the inspiratory time and how that works, how they cycling, how to get out of the IPAP into the EPAP, how can you do that? Well, you can do it in two ways. A, you can do it by time. And you're familiar that if you go into this, um, um, into these settings in the machine, one of the components that the machine will ask you if it's not in, a, in an auto track system in which it doesn't automatically, uh, it can offer you the choice for you to change it. And the inspiratory time is the amount of time that we mentioned that we remain in IPAP, therefore in inhalation. And you can tell the machine, well, I want my patient to be X amount of time in inhalation and not less than that. So you're establishing a minimal amount of time that the patient want or you want the patient to be in IPAP. But the patient may go beyond that. And how is it going to get out of the IPAP into the EPAP? It can be through flow. Now, let's pause here. Look at me for a second. And I'm going to tell you and explain you what flow is. So let's take a breath. You see that at the end of my inhalation, my flow goes down. So the question with the flow settings is at what time do you want to cut off that inhalation? Do you want to cut off the inhalation pretty early? And then you have numbers that you can fall up to 40%. That means that you cut off, literally what it means, forget about the number. What it means is that you cut it off pretty early, the inhalation. Typical example in COPDs. Again, you don't want to spend them too much in inhalation. On the opposite, you can cut off that flow at the end. And that is when you want this patient to be taking as long as a breath as possible, and you allow the flow to finish the inhalation up to the end. And that is in typical obesity hypoventilation syndrome neuromuscular disease patients. So you have seen these graphics in one of the brands of the devices, but literally the concept is you have quantitative and qualitative um, measures to change these trigger or cycling sensitivities. Sometimes, again, they ask you for qualitative measures, meaning that their settings are qualitative. They say very low, medium, or very high. Or sometimes they're going to give you numbers. So for the trigger, most of the time it's going to be a flow. And in one of the brands, it's going to be qualitative. And they want to tell you, well, this is going to be uh, the default is medium, but it could be very low or high. And you'd ask me, well, do you change really the trigger in your patients? Most of the time I don't. But sometimes, sometimes when I have neuromuscular disease patients that they have problems to initiate the breathing, I make that initiation of the breathing to uh, be easier. Therefore, I put my, my sensitivity to be higher. Now, what about the cycling? Well, the cycling I tend to manipulate more when I want to synchronize my patients, meaning the patient and the machine working um, uh, better together. And what I do is I, I take the cycle sensitivity and I ask myself, am I treating a neuromuscular disease? If the answer is yes, then if the patient is having problems with their cycling, then I tend to place it lower meaning that it's going to be cycling at the end of that flow. Remember that I mentioned to you. Or it happens that the patient has COPD. I wanted to uh, cut off earlier that um, uh, inhalation, as I mentioned to you before. And you're going to say, oh, my God, this is too complicated. I never, ever in my life I'm going to change any of these things. Well, you need to, A, the purpose of this talk is for you to be aware of this component and what do they mean? It doesn't mean that right now you're gonna to go to your clinic and change all of them. The second part is that you need to understand that they will change the way that your patient synchronize with your machine. And when you return back to this talk later, when this has been recorded and posted, I will invite you to see this uh, table 
and try to understand the concept that I have been explaining to you and how these can be changed. Again, not all patients will need changes in these settings, but some of them that they cannot tolerate the machine may need some changes. And you're gonna say, how do I know that? Well, you know that because you ask your patient and you have three questions that I want you to take out of this talk. Question number one to your patient, does the ventilator give you a breath each time you want one? If the answer is no, then you start thinking that the patient may have a trigger problem. And then you go to the trigger sensitivities and you may change it. The second question is about, do you feel that you get a blast of air? Remember, pressurization time translates into flow. The, the shorter is the pressurization time, the higher is the flow. Remember, that is a short pressurization time. So. If the blast of air, do you feel like you get it? If the answer is no, then you may need to play about this rise time. Do you feel that your breath is cut off early? That's another very uh, uh, important question. And if the answer is yes, then you have a problem with cycling, in which the machine may be cycling earlier than the patient want, or the machine may be cycling later than the, what the patient want. Again, there's a mismatch in the synchrony in between your uh, patient with an analog brain and your machine with a digital brain. You have to put them together to work together. All right, so we are quite advanced into our talk and we're gonna go to tip number six. Each breath is part of a respiratory cycle. You need to understand also that there is a bigger picture before you start managing these, these settings that you need to be aware of. And this bigger picture is that every time that you breathe in, you need to understand that there is a timing that you need to breathe out. And both of them compose what we call the total time of respiratory cycle. For those who are not pulmonary background, you have heard and doing your training at some point, something that we call IE ratio, the inspiratory expiratory timing ratio. And right now, you're uh, watching this uh, presentation, your breathing is normal, your IE ratio is one to two. Why is that? Because you, your inhalation is active through the muscle contraction, your exhalation is a recoil passive from your lungs and chest structures. So therefore, your IE ratio is one to two, or if you put it into a, uh, the inspiratory time out of the total time of respiratory cycle, that's gonna be around 33%. But you do have patients who have restricted lung disease and they are, that means that they are stuffy um, uh, chest and lungs. And what you want is to have a ratio that is one-to-one, -one, is uh, uh, spending more time in the inhalation than in exhalation. And that wanna put you into a total ratio of 50%. And then you have the opposite, the obstructive uh, 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 disease in which they have they need longer time to exhale. They remember they hyperinflate because they don't they 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 are putting too much time in inhalation, too little time in exhalation. Therefore, you need to to prefer the exhalation phase or or pr uh, allow the exhalation phase to be the longest possible. Uh, and then you do you need an IE ratio of one, three, and twenty five percent. Oh my God, how do I do that? This is extremely difficult. Well, you know, you can calculate it, but I can tell you the truth. I do have my tables that um, I try to determine what is the respiration rate of my patients. I, sorry, why do I have two tables here in, this, in your slide? Because on the, on the left, you have your um, respironics one, on the right, you have your resmed ones. And the difference in between these two brands is that um, not because the IE ratio is going to be different, is because one of the brands has another extra component into the inspiratory time that later in the uh, answer and question section, I can answer with a little bit more time. But that is the only difference, but they're quite similar. What I determine is what is my patient's breathing? What type of uh, a disease this patient has, obstructive versus normal versus restricted? So let's say that my patient is breathing at 15. Then I know that if I wanted to, if I have an obstructive physiology, then my inspiratory time is going to be around one second. What, a, but what about if it's normal, 1.3 seconds? And then what about is restrictive? I'm going to be leaving the inspiratory time longer. 
So this is how I get my inspiratory time in these patients. I go to the tables and I find it out. You can calculate it if you want to, but this is where our tables are for. Tip number seven, VAPS targets and settings are not the same. So you know this pretty much, but let me refresh your memory about these. What is a VAPS? VAPS is literally a dynamic by BiPAP. It's a BiPAP that self-adjusts itself to a target, a target that you put in your device. The target is uh, it's going to be either total volume or uh, alveolar ventilation. And these are the two brands target. They cannot do the same target because they are two different brands and they have two different copyrights. So they have to choose two different settings, but it exactly is the same concept. It's a bi-level that self-adjusts itself. What do you have in front of you? That is your BiPAP. Remember, always return to your building block. And that is your building block. So now I'm going to tell you, well, when in a volume assured pressure support, I'm going to give you an IPAP max and an IPAP means, meaning that the roof of the IPAP will be mobile and will adjust in order to generate different pressure support to get to the tidal volume or the alveolar ventilation that you have put into the machine to adjust to. So the, these devices also contain a second component. Look at the EPAP. They will have also a range. They have a little auto CPAP included that we call a, a auto EPAP. And in that EPAP, the machine can be adjusting itself to the resistance of the upper airway. So now I have the roof that moves and I have the floor that moves. This one control your upper airway. This one control your pressure support to generate the total volumes that you're going to be looking for. So if you, well, that doesn't project very well, but on, on your left, you have one brand on the right, you have the other. The difference in red, again, is your target. What is the alveolar ventilation? What is the total volume that you wanted to? There is a variation in the respiration rate. One is an auto or fixed. The other is self-calculate from a target patient rate. And both of these brands in certain devices, they will present an auto EPAP capability, otherwise it's gonna be fixed. At the bottom, you see the most common brands, um, the most common devices that you see nowadays in our clinic. So one of the things that um, my fellows comes and say, oh my, uh, this is gonna be difficult because you know, uh, in the inpatient, I have the patient on one brand and in the outpatient is coming with another, the, the DME has another brand. How do I put them together? They talk different language. One talk uh, alveolar ventilation, the other talk tidal volume. And just for the records, alveolar ventilation is nothing but the tidal volume minus the dead space multiplied by the respiration rate. You're going to say, well, this is becoming a little bit complicated. How do I get these two devices uh, relatively equal when I do the settings? Well, if you go to these devices, and I'm going to uh, mention the one that is the, the, the IVAPS, which is the ResMed, you go into a RAD or a ventilator like Astral, and you go to this menu, you're going to see the first thing, obviously, always is the mode. The second um, element that it's going to ask you is the height. Why the height? Because they have an internal calculation um, that based on the height, they can calculate the dead space. And the third thing that they will ask, well, is the target. And the fourth thing is the, the alveolar ventilation. But you see these gray areas in the bottom of that, of that um, menu? That is your minute ventilation, your tidal volume, and your minute ventilation by the ideal body weight. So now you say, oh, if I was in the other brand that it was telling me tidal volume, then I can come here and I can change up and down the target alveolar ventilation, putting my eye side to the tidal volume and see how this internal uh, calculator in the machine for the height of the patient can give me an equivalency of the tidal volume that I wanted to place. I repeat, when you have a brand that you manage in tidal volume and you have this brand that manage alveolar ventilation, how you can convert one device to the other is going to the internal calculator that the device has inside. And when you go to the target alveolar ventilation, as you see in that slide, the gray part shows um, how 
by moving up and down the target alveolar ventilation, the gray numbers there will move up and down until you match your total volume from one device to the total volume of the other device. So not difficult once you know this, how to do this. Tip number nine, not all ASV devices are the same. How many times your lab, your patient, your clinic has contacted you telling you that, uh, that your patient that has been uh, titrated for one ASV device, one of the brands, happens to receive another one from the DME and happens to say, oh, I don't feel the same. I feel that this uh, device is not helping me. It can happen. So let's go to the basics. What is ASV? Remember that I told you that NIV are by levels. By levels, not all of them target ventilation. They may target shot support of the respiration to modulate the ventilation and transform or correct a respiratory pattern that is abnormal, example, chain stock breathing, to a pattern that is more physiological. So how it does that? So the ASV by levels will have an EPAP the EPAP will uh, uh, target more the obstructive sleep apnea component. Now, the machine, if it starts seeing uh, um, a decrease in breath, will increase the pressure support and will start supporting this patient as this patient is heading into a central apnea. Then when you have the central apnea, the machine will not only support with a higher pressure support, but also will kick in with a respiration rate, remember, what is the definition of central apnea? Central apnea is the lack of effort to breathe. So you need a backup rate from the machine to step in and generate the trigger that you need in order to generate the pressure support to support your central apnea. So now you have the EPAP, your pressure support, and your respiration rate that could be either auto or fixed by you in order to generate this counterbalance proportional system. Why we call it that fancy counterbalance proportional system? Because it does exactly the opposite of what your patient is doing. When the patient is breathing, it back off and goes to the minimal IPAP and EPAP. When the patient is not breathing, it gives all the full uh, um, uh, settings of IPAP or pressure support and respiration rate. So why they're not the same? They're not the same because they look for different things. On the left, you have the RESTMED devices. On the right, you have the Respironics devices. Let's compare one head to head. The first thing that you can see is that their target metric of breathing are completely different. One RESTMED on the left is looking for minute ventilation. On the right, Respironics is looking for peak inspiratory flow. So they are different targets. So their target is the average weighted minute ventilation on RESMED, the average peak inspiratory flow on the uh, respironics. The windows are kind of similar, the pressure support are kind of similar, and the I, I, uh, EPAP are quite similar. Respironic has uh, a safety issue of minute ventilation that is minimal. And if you ask me later, I'm gonna explain you why is that in these devices. But let's go to the graphic, it's much better to me, I understand it better. So if the patient is, let's say that this is the flow of the patient, the patient goes, with no flow, the mini ventilation will drop, correct? If you don't breathe, your mini ventilation goes down. The machine will start increasing the pressure support and will look how the mini ventilation goes. If the mini ventilation is corrected, it's because that process is very likely central. If the, if the pressure support does not correct that mini ventilation target, then that means that the uh, machine is in front of an apneic event, obstructive, and the machine will increase the EPAP. So this is how this machine in ResMed works. For average weighted minute ventilation, increasing the pressure support and see what happened to the minute ventilation. If it's not corrected, that means that it's likely to be obstructive. If it's corrected, it's likely to be central. What happened with the respironics on the other machine? Well, they look for peak inspiratory pressure. So you see here the, the patient's waveform and you see here the peak flow of that waveform. Once the, peak, once the uh, breathing falls, below and it misses the peak flow target, the machine will increase the pressure support to um, uh, support the respiration in this patient. So two different ways to tackle the same problem. This is why in some cases you may see that certain patients do better one over the other is just because the technology looks at the same problem in different way. Tip 10, 
And the last one, and I know that I wanted to give you time for you to answer questions. Before change any settings, I repeat, before changes any settings, go to the basics. Never leave the basics. And the basics is what is happening to the interface. This is, I always say, this is your Achilles tendon. Everything that you do, how fancy you get with your settings, it doesn't matter because everything is going to go through the window if you're leaking pressure through your mask. Your trigger, your rise time, uh, your EPAB, your treatment, your pressure support delivery, everything is just messed up. There's not going to be anything that you think that you're delivering based on your settings are going to be completely changed by this mass click that is present. So always, always don't get fancy. Go to the basics. And one of the main things that most of the time will happen is that the mass leak will be uh, compromising the delivery of the treatment of uh, your patient. So I'm going to make a pause here. I will finish this talk right now. I know that this is a lot of ground. They asked me just for the tips, and the tips has been provided in this, um, in this discussion. Um, this is a passionate topic that takes years to master. So this is something that uh, it will take your, uh, your, your professional career to, to master these. And new technologies are completely evolving as we speak right now. So um, don't get discouraged. This is just uh, concept ideas of things that they are there. Not necessarily you have to manage them, but you need to be aware that they do exist. So I will be opening um, now to the questions, and I will love to um, to answer some of the questions that you may have. And thank you so much for for joining me and inviting me here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for uh, answering that questions. Um, I will invite people to get into the cameras. I you can get a fancy background, you can get your office background or your home background, I don't care, but I would love to have a little bit of a um, sense of community. So I invite you to get, thank you um, for everybody just to get there. Um, you can use the, the chat or you can just uh, raise your hand. I think that we have a hand system there here that you can talk to yourself and ask the question, feel free. So, um, Thank you for, for the feedback about these. There was a question here about um, for pediatrics. That's an excellent question. I don't do pediatrics. Um, my practice is adults. Uh, my pediatric colleagues, uh, as far as I know, they use the same tables. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that the, uh, these will be applicable to pediatrics. Now, if you ask me, in the range of pediatric age, if there will be consideration and adjustment of that, likely. Um, I, I'm limited by my experience just in adults. So I would say that likely if you have a teenager will apply. If you have an infant, um, I would say that probably will uh, have to come back to you. And by the way, um, my last name, period, my first name, admeo.edu. That's my email. Apologize, it's not there. Send me questions on the ones that I don't know, like th this one, I may need to go to pediatric colleagues. I can likely... Um, come back to you. In ResMed ASV, after entering patient's height and respiration rate to target alveolar ventilation calculated by the machine is often low, like 250 ml per mean. Then we have to manually correct it. That is, cor that is correct. So, so re uh, let, let me, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, how did this come into this uh, alveolar ventilation? This is literally, is 10 or 15, it's, it's a paper from the 1970s, uh, 10 or 15 patients who were uh, normal um, uh, recruited patient, um, uh, individuals in which they calculated the dead space. They did a formula and that is how this machine and this brand calculate alveolar ventilation. Raise your hand, how many of your patients are normal, healthy individuals? <laughs> None of them. All of them, they may have some, some issues respiratory wise. For example, you can have a COPD or with increasing dead space in, with emphysematous disease. So you need to make this patient uh, taller. <laughs> and when you make your patient taller, then the alveolar ventilation will be recalculated into approach. So I, I, I do agree with the comment, um, um, uh, Divya, that you made, because this is exactly, you may need to sometimes readjust it because remember these formulas come in um, from healthy individuals. So you may need to adjust it. So the next question from a previous slide, the area under the curve for the total volume is smaller for neuromuscular patients who need decreased 
uh, rise time. Does that mean that um, their delivered title volume is less than what will be given to someone with OHAs who have an increased time? Okay, so let me just review the, your question. Um, let, let me ask a question. Shan, are you on the phone? On the, uh, would you mind to unmute yourself and ask the question directly if you're still oh, here? Yeah. Sorry if it's confusing. I no, 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 please go ahead. Um, the title volume where you have less rise time for um, for neuromuscular patients, it, it just seems like the area under the curve is a lot smaller than mm -hmm. someone with OHS and you're giving them more. Um, does that mean the title volume is, is different? The, the target title volume is different from one patient to another? Just Correct. based on the graph? It may influence your total volume, but the impact of your total volume really comes from the delta pressure and the inspiratory time, not so much about the rise time. The rise time is going to influence, but not necessarily change clinically the impact of the total volume. The rise time, what it does is generate the flow. You know, when the patient tells you, oh, I feel hungry, I cannot breathe enough, um, then is when you put a rise time that is shorter, therefore it jump from EPAP to IPAP, therefore that difference of pressure is so abrupt, generate a flow that is higher, therefore they feel like they have a blow. The contrary, they say, oh my God, I'm being blasted out of the out of my sockets with this. And then the rise time, you may need to do it a little bit uh, um, more prolonged. So the inspiratory time to, 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 sorry, the EPAP to IPAP may take a little bit longer time. It, not, it doesn't influence to clinically the total volume to a degree that it will be uh, much of a change by your rise time. It's more your flow, more your synchrony. The, the really the part that is gonna change your total volume is your two parameters, delta pressure and inspiratory time. So uh, I'm gonna go to the next question. Can you comment on your experience with what an acceptable leak is and the difference in reported leaks? Oh my God, everybody seems to be pretty awake and asking me all the, the fantastic questions. This is always something that, you know, I go back into, um, if, okay, so I'm gonna tell you the answer of this. So the answer of this comes in two flavors. If you want to be a very precise, um, you will, you may know already, all the masks that you are handling right now, when you go to the manufacturer website, <clears throat> they do contain a curve that explicit tells you your mask with certain pressure, what is the expected leak, that uh, obligatory leak that you're gonna be awaiting. So if you want to know precisely what is the exact leak that you will tolerate, you need to unfortunately, dig out out of the manual of that or the online manufacturing manual that will tell you at what pressure is the leak that you will be expecting. The higher the pressure, the delta pressure, the higher is the leak. So to someone who you're, you, for example, if you have a high intensity patient that is in, let's say 25 or 27 inspiratory pressure and a PAP of five, I'm not going to be expecting a 25 or 20 liters per minute leak. I'm going to be expecting a 30 or 40 because this is a huge, humongous amount of pressure. Um, so, so the pressure leak is a little bit of a balance in which the patient can tolerate. It is known that it's going to be higher when you are having a large delta pressure. And as far as you reach your goal, remember, this is not a matter of number. This is a matter of results. If your result of your delta pressure with a patient that can tolerate whatever leak that comes from, can still get you the total volume minute ventilation that you need, so be it. But to the answer to the question correctly, we'll have to refer you to the type of mask and every mask is different. This is why it's a, a little bit of a pain in the neck to go to each of the masks and try to find out. Definitely do not expect 25 or 20, that is your outpatient threshold for most of the mask um, to be the, your threshold. You're, you're talking about high pressure, high leaks. Um, okay. Uh, is there a machine that best account for air trapping, auto peeping in a COPD patient on VAPS? No, uh, unfortunately, no. You have to go to, sorry, the question is, is there a machine that best account for air trapping, auto peep in COPD patients on VAPS? And the answer is no, there is no. Um, when you go to the real ventilators, 
they do have their waveform and you may by the waveform see that the exhalation does not reach zero and you may by um, by form waveform um, assume that there is an auto peaking but these are not really like you know the big icu ventilators that you can um, uh, calculate the the, e the auto epap in these patients um, and remember that you can still have auto epap and the uh, flow in exhalation can reach zero um, because the areas in which the um, compression or, or, or closure of the airways are going to be completely collapsed. Therefore, there's no flow. So the flow will return to zero, but it doesn't mean that you don't have auto peeping. So no, none of the ventilators that I'm a non-invasive ventilation, even the ventilators cannot calculate that. You have to go for the invasive ones. Uh, I don't have any other questions, but I'm inviting anybody who is um, joining me to just uh, unmute yourself and ask. And thank you so much, everybody, for being on, on camera. I appreciate it. Anybody may have other questions? All right. So if there are no other questions, I invite you, if you like this talk and but you like to go deeper with, for example, having patients and examples of how you do this in real life, how you adjust into numbers, really hands-on. Um, well, talk to the ASM. I'll be more than happy to come with examples um, of how I do change these settings in real life. This is just a, a general talk for criteria of what these settings are about. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you so much, Dr. Salim, for a wonderful talk. Oh, my pleasure. Talk. We well, very much appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very much. Happy holidays to everybody. Enjoy it.